let's say you've got two options. You can be with a, a group of people that are maybe somewhat beneath you, but you can be kind of the head of that group. So let's say, I don't know, for instance, you're doing athletics and you can be in two different divisions and you're kind of in between the division skill level. You can choose to be on a team in the lower level division where you will really be the star. Or you can choose to be on a team in the higher level division and you are just barely good enough to make the team and you're not going to get a lot of playing time and you're not going to be a star at all. What this is saying is be the tail to the lions. Be like the, the least guy on the really powerful squad because you know what? Being among people who are stronger than you is going to build you up. Welcome to the show. You are listening to the Real Estate Lab podcast. In this lab, we decode the stories, secrets, and skills of the most brilliant minds in real estate investing, then turn their wisdom into practical advice and knowledge that we can use to boost our income. And now, let's turn it over to our host, V. It's a great day to be alive and to invest in real estate. What's going on, lab mate? My name is Viku, and you're now listening to my show, the Real Estate Lab podcast. I'm excited to share today's episode with you. I'm talking to the author of a book called The Cash Machine, a tale of passion, persistence, and financial independence. The book is a financial book written in the form of a novel. It's a straightforward, easy to read book, whether you have been on this path for a long time, or maybe you've just started learning about financial education, you will pick up something from this book. We are going to talk about the journey of a few characters in the book. We'll talk about things like index funds, real estate depreciation, and a few other topics. My guest today is Dave Mason, a social entrepreneur, a rabbi, and business strategist. Now, Dave describes himself as a curious soul, always seeking to discover new understanding of the world. His journey has taken him through over 20 countries. Dave is a terrific guest. I'm sure you will love this episode. Before I get started, don't forget to subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. All right, let's get the show rolling. Hey, welcome to another edition of the Real Estate Lab podcast. Thank you so much for joining me this week. And today I have a special guest. He is not a real estate investor, but he is an author um, Mr. David Mason, Shalom. Shalom V, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me on. Well, thank you so much. I know it's late now and you live in Jerusalem and it's like, what, eight something over there. So we're going to try to knock this out so you can go to bed again. <laughs> um, so qu- that sounds great. <laughs> that sounds like a plan, right? So first question, uh, David, tell me, what was it like to work for work as a personal assistant to Jurgen Stock, the Interpol Secretary General? Well, I, I did not think we were starting there. That was really fascinating. <laughs> so at the time I was his assistant, he was not yet Secretary General of Interpol. Okay. And he was a professor at my law school. So I was at NYU Law. And one of the professors in the university was somebody who was connected to Interpol and was already kind of being looked upon as on the short list for the next secretary general. And he was going, wanted to spend the summer between you know, years of law school at Interpol working on a proposal for their new budget, for how they should basically allocate the expenses of the organization across all the member countries. I think there are 177 of them at the time. And he wanted to bring a, a law student along with him to work on this project. So it was pretty cool. We went to Interpol and spent the summer working at Interpol headquarters in Lyon, in Paris. And it was just this fascinating experience of being in this kind of you know, top criminal organization and learning so much from the inside and really looking about how we would redo the organization if we were to, to redo it. In fact, at the time, they, had, they were preparing for their 75th anniversary, and they were putting out a book about that. And so we had to say, him being the likely next secretary general, well, where are we going to take it in the next 25 years? So I got to co-write a section of this book about what Interpol of the next 25 years is going to look like. So we had to, I started interviewing all kinds of people, finding out, okay, where's this organization stuck? Where can it go? And it was a really fun, it was a fun summer. 
When, when was this? This was back in 98. Oh, okay, wow. It's a long time ago. Do you, you remember the, the title of that book? It's, I've looked for it. It was just the Interpol 75th anniversary thing. It was just a little internal book that they uh, were okay. they were going to be giving to all the delegates at this conference. It was not any big thing, but it was it was big because the person I was working for was the U.S. candidate to be the next secretary general. So the way he wrote this whole section about the future of Interpol was kind of laying the groundwork for his candidacy to be the next secretary general. I mean, most of the candidacy was behind the scenes stuff, different countries using their different sway to say, OK, who is going to get their candidate to be the next secretary general? And he ultimately became secretary general of Interpol. That's awesome. <laughs> A fascinating story to start. Um, then after that, you know, the summer, you went on and you became a litigator for um, natural resources firms, and you've traveled a lot over twenty countries so far, right? What where do you find the time to do all that fascinating things? It all comes from being old. <laughs> you know, when talking about these things happening over a six month period, okay, it seems like you need a lot of time. But for most of the past sixteen years, I've been living in Jerusalem and traveling almost not at all. So, you know, traveling to over twenty countries, that was a that was a year backpacking after college. And then, then law school, and as you point out, I was at Interpol, and then I spent two years as a litigator for the Natural Resources Defense Council, doing clean air, clean water, ecosystems preservation work. But really, at a certain point, I picked up I, and left. I left the U.S., I came to Israel. I loved the work I was doing as an attorney, but I looked at the lives of the attorneys I worked under, and I said to myself, I don't want that to become me. It was great as I was a single guy, and I had nothing to do with my time anyway. So if I had to work crazy hours in order to be working on a case, that was fine. But I was getting to that point in my life when I wanted to build a family and I wanted to be spending my time doing things that are more meaningful to me. You know, as you pointed out, you know, I'm, a, I'm an Orthodox rabbi. I live in Jerusalem. So I wanted to be studying Torah. I wasn't a rabbi yet. I became one after moving to Jerusalem. I wanted to be exploring my religion and exploring myself and building a family and actually getting to see them, which a lot of attorneys don't get to do. And so I shifted into business at that point to say, okay, how can I create a business that will work around my schedule rather than me being an employee for a organization where people typically work 60 hour weeks and me having to work around their schedule. Right, right. Now, in other interviews, you have mentioned that you had a very highly successful business, but um, it, it's like really volatile. You could be making a lot of money today and then... The next day, you know, if Google changed the algorithm, you could be gone. What, what was that business? So I still have that business. Okay. And the business is, it's really selling cabinet hardware online. My number one website is a website called knobs.co. And through there, we sell all kinds of cabinet hardware. And the business was very successful starting off out of the gates. And I was doing great with it until I got to the point of earning as much money as I needed to live on. Mm -hmm. Once I started earning significantly more money than I needed to live on, suddenly my own discomforts with money came to the surface and I didn't know what to do with the excess. I hadn't yet read Rich Dad, Poor Dad or any of these other books that talk about financial independence or that could really give me a philosophy of money, of how to be, how to be spending it, how to be investing it. This idea of financial independence, you know, had I, known that, ah, what I want to do is take money out of this business during the good years, because I knew from the beginning it could go away overnight. That was always a, a given. And I had some huge downturns that a huge portion of my business did go away overnight, and I had to rebuild it and figure out, okay, what is still working? How can I expand that? I didn't think I'd ever get this many years out of it, truthfully. So I always knew it could go away overnight. So had I known then what I know now, I would have said, okay, keep the business as lean as possible. Mm -hmm take as much money from this volatile business and put it into stable passive income generating investments like rental real estate, for instance, that will allow me to build up to the point of financial independence. And from that point on, if I keep making money in the business, it's all bonus. I can just keep upping my lifestyle, my charitable contributions. But once I get to the point of being able to cover my current lifestyle, mm -hmm. my stress levels would have totally dropped. 
And I would have known that, okay, if the business goes away, it goes away. It's not the biggest deal because I'm set. Right. And then any extra years that I had after getting financial independence, well, those would have been bonus. And I could have just lived even better during those times. But I didn't know that. And when I started making more than I needed, I started to feel guilt, guilty. I started to feel greedy. I started saying, okay, I should be helping more people. And okay, maybe I should be providing jobs for people. So I hired far more people than my little business could handle. And even though my revenue stayed strong, I was giving away so much of the, the revenue that I was actually went from profitable to losing money in a very short period of time. So your thinking at that point was that you only want to make as much money as you could use it for, basically to provide for your lifestyle and it, any access you need to be giving that away. Right. So that's why you hire a lot more than you need it for your business. So I want to be very clear here about the distinction between conscious and subconscious thinking. Right. Because had you asked me that back then, I would have said, of course not. That's an idiotic. But if you looked at the choices I was making, mm -hmm. what you said is 100% on point. I was not actually going on my conscious thoughts, which I would have said, of course, I want to be building a really strong financial foundation for myself. And hiring more employees is going to help me grow so much faster. I would have justified everything. But if you actually stopped and looked at it, you would have seen that the more people I hired, the less efficient the business became. The harder I was working and the less I was making. Had you ever stopped and pointed out to me this, I would have seen, oh, I'm totally off. But my, it was my subconscious that was really uncomfortable with money. If I was un because I was uncomfortable with money, I would say intelligent things, perhaps. I would say, of course, I want to do smart things with my money, but I hadn't researched money enough to know what those smart things were. And if you actually looked at my choices, you would have said, Dave, you're totally upside down. You're justifying things consciously, but if you look at all these decisions, they're really, really dumb. This is not good business sense. Mm -hmm. And had I been smart enough to pull on a mentor, a business coach, to ask questions of people who are more experienced than I was, who are more successful than I was, they would have immediately slapped me around and said, get your head on straight. You're making dumb financial choices. Why? What is going on beneath the surface with your beliefs about money that is making you so uncomfortable that you're doing stupid things? Okay, so let's talk about your book, The Cash Machine, A Tale of Passion, Persistence, and Financial Independence. Going back two years before you, you wrote this book, could you describe the scene for myself and for the listener of the moment when you had the epiphany about your financial difficulty in relation to your poor, poor choice of understanding money? So there were definitely several stages in that. One of the, the biggest stages came actually quite a few years before I started the cash machine itself. And that was, again, my business went from being very successful to being very, very unsuccessful. I was losing money like crazy. And we had other poor financial choices we'd also made, also from this place of discomfort, I think. And we were just finding ourselves in a ton of debt. And I wound up deciding to go to the Western Wall. Now, there's a tradition here. So I live in Jerusalem. I live a short walk from the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall or the Kotel, as we call it in Hebrew. And there's a tradition in Judaism that says, if you go to the Western Wall for 40 days straight and pray for one thing, you will be answered. And I said, I am in such a mess financially. I need to do this. So I started going to the Western Wall every day for 40 days and praying about this thing, you know, praying for a turnaround. And I got an answer. And it was not the answer I wanted. You know, <laughs> what I thought this whole thing meant was go for 40 days and you will get you know, what you're <clears throat> looking for. So the answer I wanted was, it's okay, Dave. You can continue making stupid business choices, but I'll make it all work out. You can continue having this very bloated staff, but it will be okay because I'll take your revenue and I'll boost it to such a high level that you can afford this gigantic staff that you don't need. And what I got instead was this moment of clarity of, you know, what are you doing here praying to me? <laughs> you know, you've been acting like an idiot, 
stop acting like an idiot and get your act together. Uh And that was a big part of the turnaround. You know, I always say that when you're digging yourself into a hole, you could always depend upon God being there with you to lend you a shovel. So, you know, while I was digging myself in, I was just, everything was possible. Like I had the easiest time ever borrowing money. Like people would come to me and offer to be, you know, give me money. And so I just dig myself in further and further and further. And then digging myself out was a process. It it took a really long time, step by step of actually learning what I was doing. And then it was just a couple of years ago, you know, we'd gotten to a nice equilibrium. We were living decently, but I had this realization that, you know, so much of what I've done stupidly around money was because I never really learned to understand it. I never got it fully. And to me, if there's a topic I need to know, there's no better way to understand it than to research and write a novel on the subject. Now, that's a little bit of a different way of going about things than most people, but that's the way I think. I've written four novels at this point. And if I was only trying to understand things for for my own use, I would have just research those things that were relevant to my life. And it's a tiny percentage of the things that I went through in the cash machine. What I wanted to do instead was to really understand globally this whole concept of money, Mm -hmm. how it worked, how to use it. And so because I was writing a novel and I was writing it for other people who had many different financial circumstances than my own, suddenly I needed to understand everything from credit cards to taxes, to real estate, to transportation, whatever. I need to understand all of this. And I just did a tremendous deep dive. And I don't know how many thousands of hours I spent listening to podcasts and reading books and doing research until I really started understanding all of these things. You know, I kept finding when the same answer would come up over and over again, it's like, okay, I've started to understand this topic. When I, when my research would just kind of reveal the same stuff. Other areas when I just keep learning new thing after new thing after new thing, I'd say, okay, no, there's so much more to go here. And I just went until I felt I really understood this. And then I put together the cash machine together with my wife. And it's it's a book that covers several hundred different financial lessons all through a love story. Now, a lot of people think that's funny. Like, why is what does money and love have to do with each other? They seem so diametrically opposed. Right. But to me, it's a very natural connection. You know, we, we know that money can be one of the number one causes of difficulty in a relationship. It's one of the top causes of divorce. It's one of the top causes of, of breakups and relationship strife. And so to me, I really wanted to get at not just the tactics of money. You know, most nonfiction money books go through tactics and strategies for how to get more money, but they rarely look at the emotional side of it at the idea that, you know what, sometimes making smart money choices will require you to make difficult social choices. And how are you going to balance those things out? And so within the story of this relationship, you had a guy, Dylan, who took a lot of very difficult choices. When he was not hanging out with his friends, he was not going out to eat, he was living with like his girlfriend Amber thought like a bum. That's what she thought when she first saw the way he was living. And she said, this guy's got nothing going on. You know, she judged people by their spending, not really by their earnings. She didn't know what he had going on beneath the surface and all of his investments. She just saw a guy who was wearing dirty clothes, who didn't own a car, who was living in a little basement apartment and saying, this guy doesn't have his act together. As opposed to her and her friends, they were living well, driving new cars, having nice apartments, going out to eat. She thought they were doing well. But really, they were all driving themselves into debt, and he was building up his assets so that he'd be set in the future. He was doing great. They financially were doing very poorly, but we don't tend to see that. Some some of that's very private. And so it was a real struggle for her to say, do I want to go down the path with this guy, That a path that requires a lot of sacrifice? Do I want to do that to be with this guy, or do I not? And her emotional struggles over it are one of the driving factors in the book. Right now, before we talk more about the book, I just want to have you share with us the biggest screw up you did in regard to money before writing the book. 
besides hiring more than you need? Like personally, what did you do? What was your biggest screw up? Personally, our biggest screw up was buying more house than we needed and then sinking a ton of cash into renovating it. We, I think our interior designer went four times over the budget we gave her for renovating this place. We had to borrow money from my parents in order to cover the, the renovations. We got ourselves so in debt, we had no cash for anything, even at a time when the market was great for investment. We had no ability to get in because we were constantly just paying debt, paying debt, paying debt for years to the point where we wound up losing the house entirely in order to pay my parents back the money they, they'd lent us so we wouldn't go bankrupt. And it was a total, total disaster. Well, thank you for sharing that. It's it's um, not something usual that you know people are willing to share publicly. And you're listening to Dave Mason, author of The Cash Machine. You can visit his website at www.buildmycashmachine.com. Now let's dive into the book. Um, let's talk about the characters in the book. Did you actually write Kyle based on yourself? Oh, no. No, okay. No, no. Kyle, Kyle is very, very far from me. <laughs> So I do, I do want to point out that whenever I write a character in a book, really to a certain extent, all of the characters are me. Okay. Every single character always has aspects of me, but I was not at all a Kyle. So Kyle, Kyle and Dylan, were they were originally the two main characters of the book, actually. They were two guys who were on a very similar path, college, most likely either law school or MBA, job at a big corporate firm somewhere. And at a certain point, they wind up meeting somebody who tells them about this whole different strategy for money and says that, you know what, if you're just looking at it, that you want to have a solid financial foundation, you're going about it the wrong way. You know, if you're chasing a dream and this is what you really want your life to be about, great, go for it. But if you're just hoping to have a strong financial foundation, you're going about it the wrong way. And Kyle says, okay, this guy is nuts. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm on a really solid path. I'm going to college and law school. I'll be taken care of financially just fine. Dylan decides to listen and decides to drop out of college and start building his cash machine, his essentially his portfolio of, of passive income sources. And the book starts seven years later when they're both in this process. At that point, Kyle is out of law school, is working with a top firm, but Kyle is not me at all. Like, despite the fact that I went to law school, I wound up going to a nonprofit job out of law school. I did not go to the big corporate firm direction. I was looking to find a way to make contribution, really. And that was much more for me. Like, okay, what's a way that I can be giving more in the world? And I didn't really know what that was. And the environment spoke to me a lot. So I went to law school and I became an environmental attorney. Kyle's not that way. Kyle really doesn't have a dream. He really doesn't have a lot of mission. He's looking for a prestigious, well-paying career. Mm -hmm. And so he's the type who goes, he's perfectly willing to get himself a quarter million dollars into educational debt and then spend money. He doesn't have more debt to have a really nice apartment and a really nice car. It doesn't bother him at all because he knows he's going to be working 60 hours a week for the next 40 years, making a killing. He's willing to put in the work He's willing to, to make the money. It doesn't bother him at all. And he's not thinking so much about his economic choices. He doesn't try to curb his spending because he just believes that he is going to be getting nearly unlimited income. He's going to be getting such a huge income that he can cover all those expenses. Right. And really, he can. He's at a certain point in the book, he makes partner. He's making a million dollars a year. He really can cover those expenses. The downside is he doesn't have a lot of time for his health. He doesn't have a lot of time for his family. He doesn't have a lot of time to pursue other interests. He really can't leave if he wants to. It's what we call like the golden handcuffs. If he wants to leave that job, if he at a certain point at age 35 discovered a real passion in his life and said, this is what I want to dedicate my life to, he'd be stuck because he has so much debt that he needs his really high salary to keep going. So the book was originally about Kyle and Dylan, and they were kind of the, you know, the control and the and the test subjects. Yeah. But at a certain point, I really found that 
the relationship between Dylan and his girlfriend, Amber, who he starts dating at this point, seven years after, you know, Dylan goes on this other path. You know, she sees Dylan, thinks that he's a total bum. And only after she starts to understand there's more going on than she realizes does she start dating him. And that relationship really became much more interesting, I think, than the relationship between Kyle and Dylan. And so much so that Amber actually went from being the number three character to the number two character to ultimately the number one character. She wound up first bumping off Kyle for number two and then bumping off Dylan as well, because Dylan, Dylan's a really stoic guy. He's the kind of guy who, when he sees something that makes sense, goes with it. He's like, okay, this will require sacrifice. This will be hard, but it makes sense. Therefore, I will do it. He's not terribly emotional. He's willing to make the hard choices and he makes them quietly. That doesn't make for a very interesting character. <laughs> what makes a book interesting to read is emotional struggle. And Amber, his girlfriend, when it's presented with this whole idea, this whole very foreign idea as to how she was raised, to how she's built her life, she's presented with this guy who she could see is a really good guy and she's looking for a good guy in her life. But he's living such a radically different lifestyle can she go down this path with him? And she doesn't know. She's really struggling with it. And she says to Dylan, she's like, I know myself. If I go too far down this path with you, then I'm going to become so emotionally attached that even if what I think you're doing is stupid, I'm going to have a hard time leaving. Mm. So before I get too emotionally attached, I want you to help me build my own cash machine. I want you to teach me about money. Let me understand this before I decide, do I want to build a life with you or do I not? So we really learn about money through Amber and her struggles and trying to weigh what is a more comfortable lifestyle, spending basically everything she's earning mm -hmm. and then some more often than not versus a lifestyle that could potentially lead her down this path of marriage and family with this guy she's, she's dating and she really likes, but that is make very unorthodox choices in her mind. Where So you mentioned to me offline that or even earlier, you said that you didn't know anything about money. Uh, so you decided to research and write a novel. Can you share what were some of the inspiration that you uh, learned from to put in the book? Absolutely. I would say that one of the biggest ones was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That one, in that book, it was the first time I actually heard anybody say that your primary residence is really often not a great place to put money. And remember, that was one of our biggest financial choices was putting money into our primary residence. Everybody had always told me, your house is your number one asset. And then I read Kiyosaki and he says, what are you talking about? A house isn't an asset. Yes, it's an asset if you move out. You know, if you sell it, you can make money on it. If you move out and you rent it out, you can make money on it. But if you can afford to live in a $200,000 house and you buy yourself a million dollar house, and convince yourself it's an asset, actually, it is going to be a huge drain on your, on your income. And I like how Kiyosaki de defines assets and liabilities. It's like an asset is something that brings you more money. A liability is something that drains your money. That's not how the accountants look at it. Accountants would look at a house and say, okay, on paper, it's worth a million dollars. Wow, therefore, you have so much net worth. But really, if this thing that is worth a million dollars requires you to be pumping huge amounts of cash in every month just to be even covering the interest payments you owe on it, it's actually a liability to your ability to build up a strong finan financial foundation for yourself. And then in the book, another thing you talked about was um, depreciation. I'm just curious, did you learn from depreciation from talking to your friend, Yona Weiss? Absolutely. Yona Weiss was that that moment was an absolute revelation to me. So Yona Weiss is actually the person who introduced me to V. And at the time, he actually wasn't even a friend. Oh, at the time, I didn't I didn't actually know Yona. And I had reached out on um, on Bigger Pockets. I went on Bigger Pockets a lot. I read a lot on, on the blog. I listened to the podcast. It was a really great resource for me. And I started asking questions and I told the, the community, hey, by the way, I'm looking for um, I'm trying to research this book and I'm looking to understand all these different areas. And Yona was one of the first people who reached out to me and he said, you know what? 
I'd be really happy to sit down with you and to talk to you about these things. And what I learned from him was absolutely mind blowing because he taught me the concept of accelerated depreciation. And this is something that was one of the biggest things I learned and has actually had some of the biggest impact on me personally since I learned this in terms of my own investment strategy. So accelerated depreciation, for those who don't know. So a, a residential property depreciates in the U.S. at over 27 and a half years. Commercial property over 39 years. But what Yona explained to me was that actually you can really break that down and depreciate certain aspects of a property much, much faster. So this was a total revelation for me. So for instance, the example we give in the book, like say you buy a million dollar property. Now, the land the property is on doesn't depreciate at all. So let's say there's $200,000 is actually the value of the land. So you've got $800,000 and most people would depreciate that over 27 and a half years. But actually a lot of what you purchase is not really the building at all. A lot of it might be if you bought a furnished property, well, the furniture can be separated from the building. Lighting, flooring, cabinets, landscaping, all these things can be separated from the cost of the building. So maybe there's a million dollar purchase you had is $200,000 of land, $600,000 of building, and $200,000 of stuff that can be looked at differently. And most of that stuff, like the furniture and the lighting, and et cetera, can depreciate over five years, which means you can take that $200,000 of the value of the stuff depreciate over five years, which means you get $40,000 a year of depreciation on that. And then whatever the rest is, 600,000 divided by 27 and a half, plus that it gets over the first five years, you get a ton of depreciation. And you can use that if your income is passive, it can knock out tremendous amounts of your income. So you can basically erase your tax burden in a lot of cases. Now, for the listener, if you're interested to hear more about this concept and also to learn, listen to Yona Wise, he was on episode 12. So you just go to links.realestatelab.live slash one two. And um, so was was Yona uh, the character of Vinny? No, Yona it was that was definitely not Vinny. Yona does does not have. This, uh, this huge agenda against the, the IRS. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, when I was in law school, my roommate actually specialized in tax law and went on to become a, a tax law partner in a, in a big law firm. And so, you know, I wanted being around a, a tax attorney a lot. And, you know, my roommate was, well, he's somebody that I thought was a great guy. From a reader's point of view, they consider him really dull. Mm. Because you you want to have you know the, like any any character out in the book basically any tax attorney is probably going to come across to a reader as pretty dull. These are guys who wear suits, and they're pretty stable individuals. You know, this is a guy who works hard and supports his family and is a big member of his community. And there's nothing there's not a lot of drama in his life. The type that is going to make a really interesting character in a novel. So I didn't want to take a typical tax attorney and use a tax attorney to be describing tax law. Mm -hmm. You know, same thing with accountants. Accountants are often fairly boring people in real life. They don't make for interesting characters in books. You want more volatility than that. So all tax law in the cash machine is taught to this guy, Vinny. Now, Vinny, when he was a kid, the IRS came and audited his mom. And his mom had operated a little store out of their basement and she didn't know she had to keep receipts. And so when the, the IRS was asking for documentation on all of her expenses, she couldn't give it. So they hit her with a giant fine and she wound up losing her house and they had to go move in with his mom's sister. And Vinny was, you know, saw the absolute humiliation on his mom's face and swore that he would never pay the IRS a dime. And so I used the character of Vinny to describe all tax law, basically how somebody could be making a million dollars plus a year, which Vinny is, and pay zero in taxes, because it's entirely possible. You know, I, I remember that moment in the debate between Trump and, and Hillary, mm -hmm. 
when she accused him of saying, you know, you pay zero taxes. You've made billions of dollars and paid zero taxes. And he jumps in and says, because I'm smart. Now, whatever your political bent is, that's kind of the moment I'm looking to capture with Vinny. Somebody like, like Trump was able to legally use the tax system to become a billionaire and pay nothing in taxes. And so I just, how did he do it? I describe all that through the character of Vinny going through with the guy who just is insisting on never paying the IRS anything. Anyone can do that as well. Now, most of your listeners probably won't choose to do that because there are certain choices you need to make with how you earn and how you invest your money. You can't just carry on earning money with however you're earning it and investing it however you're investing it and then expect your accountant to come back and say, oh yeah, I'll just check the magic box that says you owe no taxes. Getting to zero taxes really requires you to understand the tax system and understand ways of earning it that have a ton of tax incentives applied to it, ways of investing it that have a ton of tax incentives applied to it to allow you to really go about being able to earn money and not owing any taxes. So most people don't want to necessarily be Vinnies, but I wanted to use Vinny to really illustrate what is possible because it is amazing what is possible with taxation in the United States. And, and it could be the same everywhere else. As long as you know how to use the tax code to your benefit, uh, at the end of the day, you don't probably have to pay much taxes at all. That's true. And now in the book, another section that I want to discuss with you um, is when Dylan was trying to convince Amber that he could demonstrate 10 ways that index funds could be better. Now, for our listeners, you know, um, risk investor, risk days are great. But if you're looking to diversify um, index funds, it's something that you should definitely look into. So could you just share a little bit about the top three ways that you, um, you know, wrote in the book? Absolutely. So a few different aspects of how index funds are different from mutual funds. And really, I'd say they boil down into two main categories, taxes and fees. So mutual funds have so many different fees associated with them. A lot of Dylan's top 10 are going after these different fees so that the mutual funds make money. They, they bill you when you go into the fund. They bill you when you come out of the fund. They bill you a certain percent of your total holdings every year, whether the fund goes up or whether the fund goes down. And if the fund goes up, they take a nice chunk of however much it goes up. There's tons and tons of fees. So you might think that having an analyst picking your stocks is a lot better than having a random collection like the S&P 500 of just a preset group with nobody buying and selling. Right. But actually, even if the analysts do better, it is very often it is the case that all of the fees actually take away all of that advantage. So mutual funds, I think 96% of them do not beat the S&P 500 every year. 96%, meaning 4% beat it, but it is rarely the same 4% every year. And then of course, when they're looking to to get new clients, which ones do they advertise? They advertise you know, the 4% that had beat it. So very often the funds are changing. You know, they're, they're not telling you that actually the vast majority of their funds are losing against the S&P 500. They're advertising the small percent that beat it in the past, but it's very unusual that those same funds will continue to beat it in the future. Mm -hmm. That is one really big aspect. And there's tons and tons of fees there. The other major category is taxes. And taxes are a giant feature. Here's the big reason with the taxes, why there's a, such a huge difference. Because you might think, well, one of them is a big portfolio of stocks and the other is a big portfolio of stocks. Why should they be taxed any differently? And here's why. The difference is between long-term and short-term capital gains taxes. So very simply, if you, if you buy a stock and you own it for a month, let's say it doubles over the course of a month and you sell it, you will pay short-term capital gains tax, which is basically the same as paying income tax. You'll pay a very high level of tax on those gains because you owned it for less than a year. If you own the stock for a full year and then you sell it, you will earn what is called long-term capital gains, which is a much 
lower tax rate. Now, you might say, oh, but I owned my mutual fund for 20 years. Therefore, it should be long-term capital gains, right? And the answer is no. Mutual funds are always taxed at short-term capital gains. Because even though you might have owned the mutual fund for 20 years, you are not looked at being as the owner of a single entity. You, you think you're buying into a fund and the fund is a thing. It's not, at least in the government's eyes. What the fund is, is a cooperation of people buying all of the various assets in the fund. And those assets are being bought and sold continually. So the fund managers are buying, selling, buying, selling, buying, selling. They're rarely holding on to these stocks for more than a year. So even though you think I've held this mutual fund for all these years, I should have pay long-term capital gains. In the government's eyes, since the stocks that the mutual fund is comprised of have not been held for that long generally, they always tax mutual funds as short-term capital gains. Your taxes are much, much higher. Now, that is not the case with index funds. Index funds are not actively managed. When you buy the S&P 500, you know, those companies don't change very fast, which are in the top 500. It's basically you're buying and holding those exact same stocks. It's not really changing. And because it doesn't change much at all, the government looks at index funds as exclusively long-term capital gains. Mm. So it's, you know, as long as you've held this fund for the, for the year, it's going to be built as long-term capital gains. So if you put your retirement money into into a mutual fund, you know, that can be taxed at a much higher rate than if it's in an index fund. Though I should point out that retirement funds are sometimes a, an exception to that. If you're in a Roth IRA or if you're in a uh, 401k, then usually one of the big advantages of those is that you really don't pay capital gains tax on that money anyway. So within those funds, the, you do save on the taxes, but the difference in the fees is still so high that it almost always index funds are going to beat the mutual funds. They can even charge you one of the things that Dylan points out. I think one of the most ridiculous fees that they charge you is an advertising fee. <laughs> now, the mutual fund companies, are, you know, if they're running ads in the newspaper, if they're running TV ads, whatever, they can actually pass those ads on to their investors. It's totally legal. You'd think that, wait a second, why shouldn't their advertising come out of their share? No, right. they can take it out of your share, which to me is just mind blowing. <laughs> Interesting. That's that's a surprise to me on the advertising fee. I did not know that um, it exists before. I just kept on thinking, you know, it should come out of your operating fund instead of passing it to the investors. Now, um, now, Dave, in writing this book, what surprises you the most? I think the taxes. You know, I now believe that taxes in the United States are completely optional. You know, we had this whole line that there are the two things that no one can avoid are death and taxes. We, I've heard that so many times. And one of those is like true. Vinnie, <laughs> yeah, like Vinny says, you know, neither one has caught up to me yet. So Vinny believes he can maybe outsmart death, but definitely outsmart taxes. And I now believe that taxes are entirely optional in the United States and many other countries that have similar tax law systems. Right. Now that you have this this book out for a um, few months now, um, what's your what has been the the message that you um, wanted to brought out to your audience and um, have you been receiving mails and, and letters saying that, uh, you know, this message had helped them a lot? Absolutely. The, the biggest thing I have to, to give people is just really this idea of get yourself a strong financial education, become financially literate. And what I've aimed the book to do, like this book is not going to make you financially literate just on its own, but it's going to expose you to so many different areas. So that, for instance, with taxes, you're not necessarily and real estate, you're not necessarily going to be ready to file your own taxes and do your own tax law and go out and buy your first real estate property when you finish reading my novel. You know, it's 
that would be going pretty far to get people to that point. And there's only so much that a novel can do. Hmm. But by the time this book is over, you will be exposed to so many different areas of money. You will know what is possible. And you will know, oh, if I want to learn more about this area, I can go here, here, and here, and I can get that information. So to me, it's answering a lot of questions, but probably even more than that, it's posing questions. It's arousing different thoughts in your mind. And one of my biggest goals, in addition to making people financially liter literate, is really being able to bring a bunch of things that are subsurface to the surface. So again, now this is a love story. And it is so because money is just one of the biggest causes of relationship strife. And I really believe that that is not, that doesn't mean lack of money. It's not like if we only had more money, our relationship would be okay. Very often, what it means is that two people are not on the same page about money. And I find that money is a topic that a lot of people are not comfortable talking about. So if you grow up not talking about money, you might get into a relationship and still not be comfortable talking about money, even though now it's something that is very, very relevant to you. Right. So this book is hoping to like raise questions. So I think a lot of the reason why people are not comfortable talking about money, they don't even know what to talk about. They don't have financial goals, so they can't discuss their financial goals with their partner. But once they read this book and they're realizing, oh, maybe that should be a financial goal. What do you think about that? Oh, maybe, you know, Amber and Dilla did X, Y, Z. Maybe we should do X, Y, Z. What do you think about that? I think it'll allow people to discuss financial issues, to learn about financial matters, and really ultimately make better financial choices. Now, the goal I set myself is by January 1st of this year to help 10,000 people improve their financial state. That doesn't mean 10,000 downloads of my book. That doesn't mean 10,000 people reading my book. It means 10,000 people who read the book and implement at least one of the strategies in the book and see positive financial gains from it. I want by January 1st that at least 10,000 people are in a better financial state for reading this book than they were before. That's really what motivates me and gets me fired up that, you know, the financial mistakes that I made, they can now avoid because they've got this resource that I didn't have available to me. So let's talk about the book. Now that you have written this book and you have released it, right? And now you have this book available. How has your life changed because of the research you did and, and because writing this book? Financially, our lives have changed dramatically. And it's really kind of a funny thing because we've had people in our community who've said to us, you know, if you guys learned all this about money, why don't I see any difference in you? You know, what's their expectation? Their expectation is like an amber. If we were doing better financially, we would be spending more money. Right. And we're, and we're not spending more money. Therefore, it must be that we're not doing any better financially. Actually, we're doing so much better financially because we're making so many smarter choices. And one of those smarter choices is not spending that money we're doing, we're, we're getting, is taking our money and investing it in sources that are good passive income generators. You know, I'm not actually a huge fan of the stock market. We talk about the stock market, but I like passive income. This is something I didn't like before I researched the book, but I really understood that one of the best things you can do, be doing is taking your money and putting it into something that is going to be generating passive income, like residential real estate, for instance, or like investing in a good, reliable, small business that has very predictable profits. And that's what we're doing with our money. We're putting it into small businesses and real estate investments that give predictable monthly payouts. And it's all totally passive. We don't have to go and work for that money. And we realize that that's what we want to be doing. We want to be taking as much money off the table as possible, getting it away from where we're going to be tempted to spend it and sticking it into something that is just going to be returning regular money to us. And as like, I can see us on this, on this path and little by little, as these investments we put into start giving us dividends, we're taking steps towards financial independence, which is now our goal. We didn't have a money goal. When I started my business, I didn't have a goal of what to do with money. I didn't know this concept of becoming financially independent, which again means that your passive income exceeds your cost of living. 
Had I known about that goal, I think we would have hit it within five years. As it is, it's 16 years later and we haven't hit it and we've been in debt and we lost the house and we almost lost the business and we had to pull ourselves up and only now are we on the path, but it's because of the research we did around this book and the lessons that we teach in the book, implementing them in our own lives. That's terrific. Thank you so much for your time, Dave. Now, we again, listening to David Mason, author of The Cash Machine. Now, you can visit him at www.buildmycashmachine.com. Before I let you go, Dave, um, one last question. What is your most favorite Jewish saying? My favorite Jewish saying. So it's funny you should, you should ask that because my business, my corporation is called Tale of the Lion. And everybody looks at that and say, what kind of a business name is Tale of the Lion? That's the, that's the corporation. You know, my actual website is, is the Knobs Company. That's how we kind of interface with, with the world. But you know, it's under my corporation, Tale of the Lion. And people think it's like just this bizarre name. And it comes from my favorite Jewish saying, which is be a tail to lions rather than a head to foxes. Ah, that's a good one. So what it means for those who don't immediately understand, I didn't understand the first time I heard it, was that let's say you've got two options. You can be with a a group of people that are maybe somewhat beneath you, but you can be kind of the head of that group. So let's say, I don't know, for instance, you're doing athletics and you can be in two different divisions and you're kind of in between the division skill level. You can choose to be on a team in the lower level division where you will really be the star. Or you can choose to be on a team in the higher level division and you are just barely good enough to make the team and you're not going to get a lot of playing time, and you're not going to be a star at all. What this is saying is be the tail to the lions. Be like the, the least guy on the really powerful squad, because you know what? Being among people who are stronger than you is going to build you up. Rather than being the top guy amongst the foxes, don't try to be the number one guy on a weaker squad, because being with people who are not as strong as you is going to pull you down. And that's something I think about a lot when looking for mentors, when looking for people to connect with, when looking for strategies and saying, okay, you know, who are the best people out there in this field and what are they doing? How can I learn from them even if I'm not as good as they are? What can I pick up from them? How can I be spending time with them? How can I be, you know, in a mastermind group with the people who are absolutely the tops? That's the people I want to be learning from rather than learning from those who might look up to me, but really don't have as much to, to give me or they won't challenge me as much. Holy cow, that is, that's terrific. I love that. Thank you so much, Dave. Thanks so much, V. Hey, I hope you have enjoyed the show. Please let me know any comments you might have. You can send me an email at v at realestatelab.live or my Instagram handle is at vq. Hey, if you haven't done so yet, make sure you hit the subscribe button on iTunes to get notified when I release a new episode. While you're there, don't forget to leave a review and a five-star rating. Oh, and hey, don't forget to pick up a copy of The Time Machine on Amazon as well. It has been a pleasure serving you each week. This is VQ. I'm signing out. That's the end of the show. Don't forget to subscribe, leave a five stars rating and review on iTunes for the Real Estate Lab podcast. Until next time, have a prolific week.